Matthew, Matthew 22 is where we're going to read from tonight. It's the parable of the great feast. Uh, it says, Jesus, Jesus also told them the parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the, the story of the king who prepared the great wedding feast for his son. When the, ban when the banquet was ready, he, he sent his servant to notify those who were invited, but they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them, the feast has been prepared. The bull has been fattened, the cattle has been killed, and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But the guests that he had invited ignored them and went on their own way. One to his farm, another to his business. Others seized the messenger and insulted them and killed them. That's some pretty angry people for, for free stuff. The king was furious, no doubt, and he said, out an army to destroy the murderers and burn down their town. And he said to the servants, the wedding feast is ready and the guests I invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go out to the streets and the corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the banquet hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed the man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for the wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you weren't wearing wedding clothes? But the man had no apply, reply. I've been a lot of, lot of banquets and parties that people show up, they ain't supposed to be there. I think it's this guy right here. <laughs> then the king set aside, bind his hands and his feet and throw him into the outer darkness where there's gonna be weeping and gashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Uh, the same way that the king has went out and he's given this invitation to the people that he thought were worthy enough to come to his feast, that Christ has given us this same invitation. And I, I know how the king feels because I recently had my son graduation party and thank God he graduated this year. Hallelujah. Now we can start paying for college and get that over with. But I know how he feels because we sent out 80 invitations or so and then we put on their RSVP. And that's, you know, you call, you, you put my phone number there, you call me, that way we know how much dinner to provide and all that good stuff. I think we got five out of 80. So I know how the king felt. But at the time the party came, at least about 50 of them came. So we had a good time. But the same invitation Christ gives us. But we have to respond to this RSVP. It's something that we have to decide to do. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about responding to the invitation. We have all types of invitations in our life, especially as young people. We have invitations to go to parties in school. We have invitations to go to a play in college. We have invitations to go to another church. So there's all these different types of invitations. Some of them are good and some of them are not. But it's on us to respond to the invitations that are best for our life. So I want to hit three points real quick. And then we'll get out of here. Amen? Our response to God's RSVP is critical. It's critical. It's the dangerous thing to take light of what God has done for us. Amen? Just like in verse 5, it says, But the guests, had invited, the guests that he had invited ignored them and went on their own way. They ignored everything, everything that the king said. Now, this, this is the king. Okay? This is the king. This is not like me inviting you over to my house for some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, right? This is the king. The king said, hey, come on. I, I've got my, my, my best calf. I brought him out of the field. I got him in the feedlot. He's getting fat, right? Where everybody knows the, the meat around the fat is the best, right? Not the best for you, but the best. But he said, come on. I got all of this prepared. And these people were like, nah, I, I'm too busy. I'm guilty of that. Sometimes my wife has to say, hey, it's Sunday. I'm like, oh, we all get busy. We all get busy sometimes. Or sometimes, not, not as often as she has to nudge me, but I nudge her. And it's always that way with kids, right? Try to get a six-year-old up after you kept him up past 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Wow. But if it would have just stopped there, but then he says that the other's messengers were insulted and then killed. These people are really mad to be invited for something free. I don't, I don't totally get that one. These guys, hey, look, hey, can, I, can I invite you over to the house to get supper? No, but I can kill you. 
So I, I don't totally get that one. But it's critical that we answer God's RSVP. Um, everybody knows Christians and outside of Christians that this man named God, this thing named Jesus. But we don't always have that personal relationship. We all have it, took that RSVP from them. But it's not only the people that don't know the king, because obviously most of these people here knew the king. They knew who the king was. You know, I don't always, you know, like everything that our president does, but if he invited me to the White House and he fixed me a dinner, I'm going to go. I'm going to see about what they eat at the White House, you know, because I didn't get this big by looking at food. I like food. If you invited me at your house, I would go. It don't matter. If you invite me over for dinner, I'm probably going to be there. And that's what I was thinking with these guys here. But even Christians and non-Christians, even non-Christians, we have to check ourselves and understand that it is critical, not only the first invitation that Christ gives us, but every invitation that comes after that. Because there's callings on each and every one of our lives. We can, we can answer that first invitation and walk the aisle and, and the pastor can lead us in the, in, the, in the prayer and all that stuff. But if we quit listening after that, then what? There's a call that comes after that. And we have to continue to answer the invitations that Christ has for us. So it's critical. We have to examine our own lives to make sure that we have the same enthusiasm as we did the day we walked out. The day that we came back from camp, that we, we couldn't wait to tell everybody we knew about Jesus. There's something special about that, that firstborn enthusiasm. Right? I was really excited when my baby was born. All of them. All four of them. But about eight, nine, ten years in, when they're talking back and they can always have their hand out for money, I'm not so excited. My son told me on the way home from church, he helped pick up his own mess, his own mess, and then he told me I owed him two dollars. <laughs> I'm not too for sure how that works. But then he told me, <laughs> check this one out. You can tell we're in a whole different century now. He said, if I didn't pay him those $2 past today, this was yesterday, he gave me two days to give him $2, <laughs> that I was going to have to give him a credit card, take it to the bank and put lots of money on it, and then give it back to him. <laughs> yeah, see what I'm living with? Some of y'all better be glad your, your babies are grown and out of the house. But we have to have that same enthusiasm as the day that we were that baby Christian. We have to have that hunger for righteousness. We have to have a hunger for righteousness because if the hunger goes, then we're going to die. Just the same way as we feed our body. We have to continue to have that hungerness for God. So the response to God's invitation is critical. Critical. God's RSVP extends to everyone. It extends to everyone. It's not just a chosen few. They're in the story the king just reached out and he chose just the chosen few to come to his RS, to come to his party. But when they said no, he said, okay, I don't care what, what, what uh, side of the tracks you grew up on. Now we're going to open up this thing for everybody. Everybody. So it's opened up to everybody. The king sent, what did he say in his, in his word? He said he went and he invited the good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen. He don't care what you are, what you look like, how much money you make. He invited you in to his, his palace there. And the last invitation in the Bible extends in Revelation 22, verse 17. It said, the spirit and his bride says, come. Come. Let everyone who hears, come. Let any, anyone who thirsts, come. Let anyone who desires drink, come. I get thirsty and hungry, so I know he's calling me. Right? It doesn't matter who you are. If you're living and you, and you desire drink, if you desire God, he said, come. He's, it don't worry about your, your skin color. It doesn't worry about the way you dress. He just says, come. Look, the invitation is there. Now it's up to you. It's extended to everybody. God's invitation, it don't matter if you're a murderer or a rapist or a prostitute. Everyone is invited. And 
Paul's, one of Paul's writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, it says, Don't you realize those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourself. Now this one, it says, Those who indulge in sexual sin, worship idols, commit adultery, male prostitutes, practice homosexuality, that are thieves, and goes on and on, drunkards, abusive people that cheat, will not inherit the kingdom of God. When I was preaching this message to the youth, I said, I was all of those. And they kind of looked at me like, you was a male prostitute? <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. And poor Cheryl, she was cracking up back there. But no, not all of them. <laughs> but a bunch of them, I was. Verse 11, it says, some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. We got to get excited about that. It's extended to everybody. It doesn't matter if you're any of those things. Even when they looked at me crazy when I called myself a prostitute, he would have took me. He would have took me. I remember a friend of mine, he went to minister in Belize, and, and, and this lady that was all messed up on drugs sold her baby to get high. And she had this, this depression, oppression on her life so much that she wouldn't even say the sinner's prayer. But let me tell you, it doesn't matter if you sell your baby. It doesn't matter if you have an abortion. I know this man named Jesus. Jesus. And I thank, I thank God for sending his son. That's what we call grace, amen? That's what we call grace. I, I, I tell the young people that we can't live on grace, but we can live by grace. Some people want to live on grace. We can do what we want to do because there's grace. Oh, mercy and grace. We can live by grace, but we can't live on. If, we can, if we're living on grace, we need to check our heart. We need to check our heart. And this is my favorite one, and then we're going to get out of here. Grace doesn't eliminate standards. I'll tell you what, when I, when I first started ministering with, uh, with the Christian hip-hop, this is one of the big things I began to just to really just teach on and, and, and live by. I told them, just because you do hip-hop don't mean you can't be a professional. When you go into church, you talk to a pastor, pull your pants up. Talk to them like you know how to talk. If you're on stage and you're doing what God has sent you to do to be a, a hip-hop minister, then, then you can get one of the kids' level. But when you're, when you're talking to folks, talk correct. Because grace doesn't mean that we can't live by standards that God has given each and every one of us. The fact that we enter the kingdom of, by grace doesn't mean that we have to be down where we used to be. We have to put on the, a new garment. I'm not saying don't come as you are, but when you get here, you need to start making some changes. And it, didn't all, it, it, it don't happen overnight, but you know what? It, it can happen. I listened to some of the some videos and tapes the way I used to talk and the way I talk now. The Lord just gave me a whole new vocabulary. Because you know what? I honor God. And we got to honor God. It says, the king who gave the, the banquet discovered that one man. In verse 11, it says, but when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed that a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for the wedding. I began to think about that. You go out in the highways and the byways and you invite all these people in, and then you get on to them for not being dressed the right way. And I started thinking, well, well maybe if he didn't... What if he didn't have the right clothes? And then I read a commentary where the commentary said in those days that the king supplied everything that they ever needed. The king supplied the needs of everybody that was showing up for the RSVP. It didn't matter. They, gave, they supplied the food. They supplied the garment. They supplied everything that you need to survive. My, my king... When I made that walk to the altar, 
From that day on, he supplied all of my needs. 